The Honourable Member for Wentworth. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Today we are going to address, as this uh, matter of public importance, the failure of the budget to address Australia's fundamental economic problems. This uh, budget tried to perform a very difficult task. It tried to continue with the, what has been a blatant politically driven early election strategy and to dress that up as uh, being uh, responsible. And when you cut through the veneer of responsibility that's been painted by the Treasurer in this year's budget papers, there's an overwhelming disappointment at the extent to which this budget has failed to address our fundamental economic problems. It fails to develop an effective anti-inflationary strategy. It fails to develop a strategy to stimulate national savings. It fails to have an effective strategy for reducing our total debt. It fails to develop an effective strategy for increasing our productivity and our exports. It threatens a recession and it offers little hope for all Australians on the interest rate front. And finally, it has no answer, absolutely no answer, to the emerging wages breakout that's evident in this country at the present time. In the brief time available to me today, I want to pick up three or four features of the budget and focus on them as, uh, as, uh, as matters of specific comment. Firstly, I want to lift the veneer of responsibility. Secondly, I want to talk about the issue of recession, ducked in a question uh, to the Treasurer today. Third, I want to talk about the rape of the corporate sector that's inherent in this budget. Fourth, I want to talk about the wages issue and the potential wages explosion. And if there's time, I want to have a look at this new concept for the IAC. If we focus on the, uh, on the budget and the veneer of respectability or in responsibility, I'd emphasise to everyone in this House not to be influenced by the, uh, by the size of the, of the surplus. In fact, there are two elements, I guess, to this veneer, the size of the surplus and more honesty on the forecasts. But on the size of the surplus itself, it's important to recognise where this $9.1 billion has come from. The average Australian's got every right to ask why they should be enthusiastic about a surplus of this order of magnitude, especially when it stands erect as a monument to Keating's outstanding tax ripoff, to bracket creep, to sales tax excesses, and to a decision to tax workers' superannuation, as well as, of course, in true Keating style, it stands as a monument to his innovative accounting in respect of this year's, uh, in this year's outcome. Now, last night I, uh, I showed the Treasurer a chart which summarises quite nicely his performance in government and it emphasises quite clearly where this surplus has come from. A phenomenal rip-off in tax over the life of, uh, of this government. The only significant expenditure restraint has been on payments to the states and the effect of that has of course been that they've been pushed into debt They've been out there raising government taxes and charges, all of which have impact on all Australians. The restraint on the Treasurer's own expenditure has been absolutely minimal over the life of this, uh, this government. So uh, in simple terms, the Treasurer has set, himself out, set out to make himself look good and uh, to doctor his, uh, his budget performance at the expense of everyone else. And it doesn't mean anything that he's running a surplus. If he's retiring debt, uh, if uh, everyone else is being forced uh, to run up debts and uh, being forced into debt. Now, if we look at his innovative accounting in this budget, it's very clear what he's done. He's pushed a substantial amount of revenue from last year into this year, and he's brought forward a substantial amount of revenue, tax revenue in particular from the corporate sector, from next year into this year. If we go back and look at last year's budget outcome, there was uh, an underestimate for non-PAYE individual tax, which we notice in this budget goes up by 20%. That item goes up by 20%. Shoved from last year into this year to the tune of uh, in excess of a billion dollars, somewhere around a billion and a quarter dollars. Secondly, there were some reserve bank profits which were not collected last year, which were brought into account this year. Thirdly, there's the payment from defence service homes of a billion dollars, which, uh, for which there was a choice to get it uh, paid last year or this year, it was paid on the 14th of July this year. And of course, there's the $1.4 billion and the associated public sector debt interest savings, 
of $400 million that have been brought forward in a one-off game. And if you take those sort of adjustments and undoubt undoubtedly a host of others off this budget surplus, you find that this surplus is significantly less than last year's outcome. Fiddled the books, I think. Definitely fiddled the books. Definitely set out to look responsible rather than actually deliver the goods. The simple fact is this budget has eased fiscal policy. And you've been about easing fiscal policy, irrespective of your rhetoric, for the best part of the last 18 months. So the difference between last year's May statement and the budget, there is an increase in expenditure. There's an increase in expenditure again in, uh, in this budget. You are on an increasing expenditure uh, tack. The second point I want to raise something about is uh, the issue of a recession. And uh, as the Treasurer pointed out in his answer today, his growth forecast for the year is for two and three quarter percent. And he boasts, you know, that's pretty good by OECD standards. But he neglects to point out the fact that growth, it's working off a very strong base. There is a possibility that that base will be upgraded and that growth is uh, carrying on strongly into this particular quarter, at least the first quarter of this financial year. Now, the fact is, if there is no more, if there is no more growth in this whole financial year, that growth number still comes in at 1.8 per cent. It still comes in at 1.8 per cent. And if there is a growth in the September quarter of 0.9 of 1 per cent, then the next three quarters have to be zero growth quarters in order to get the, uh, the uh, outcome of 2.75% 2 2 for the year as a whole. The truth behind this number is that the Treasury people have built in the possibility, the realistic possibility of a recession in the second half of this year. As growth is still running quite strongly on the Treasury's own admission in this half year, and to the extent it exceeds those sort of numbers that I drew attention to, the second half of the year will be negative to give him his, his outcome. And of course, if you look at it in, in somewhat more detail and relate it to the employment forecasts and the unemployment forecasts, you find, although it's not stated explicitly again, that unemployment is predicted to go up in this budget. It's presently around 6%. The average unemployment rate for the year as a whole is to be six and a quarter. I think it implies a sizeable increase in unemployment through the year in order to get that result. There's no doubt that there is, as Senator Walsh warned us some months ago, a very high risk of a recession under this strategy. And don't forget what this strategy is. It's to stay with interest rates. It's to hope that those interest rates bite. It's to hope that they slow down the economy and, uh, and to uh, achieve a soft landing. It's basically sit on interest rates and pray. There's no more substance to the, uh, to the strategy uh, than that. The third uh, point that I'd like to draw attention to is, of course, the rape of the corporate sector. Now, the Treasurer needs investment. He tells us constantly how he needs investment. But the corporate sector, <coughs> the corporate sector is definitely being raped in this budget. $1.4 billion of tax brought forward. $1.4 billion of tax brought forward as a result of uh, of a desire to, uh, get the corporate tax to, sorry, to get the corporate sector to pay their tax earlier and to get them to pay the PAYE tax for large companies twice a month. This guy's got no idea what that means for a lot of companies. But a substantial increase in tax. And of course, where are they going to get the money from to pay that tax? Right? They're going to have to spend about $330 million a year on, uh, on interest because most of the corporate sector will fund those earlier tax payments out of, out of borrowings. And so that, uh, you know, a double slug, he holds his interest rates up, and he increases their tax burden by bringing it forward, and he slams them with a, <coughs> excuse me, with, a, with a high interest rate as well. And of course, they're expected to also live with a 3% occupational superannuation increase, and they're expected to live with the prospect of a wages blowout. And despite the fiction in this, in this budget of earnings growth of 65 uh, or 7%, it's already running at 8% and we're about to get the wage in increases flowing through. There's plenty of drift out there. There's every, every chance that these earnings numbers will be well above, well above the uh, budget time forecasts. They are fictional forecasts. They are the weak point. There is a wages breakout going on in this country. There is an earnings breakout going on relative to the 6.5% uh, the uh, deal that was done with the ACTU. And, uh, there is uh, collectively, therefore, a substantial rape of the corporate sector. And as I say, the bottom line is he needs investment 
He needs investment to sustain productive capacity, and when he most needs it, he slams the group that is supposed to do that investment. The fourth point I wanted to talk about was uh, wages policy, and I was uh, drawn to, uh, last night. I was influenced by the uh, the comment made by Simon Crean, and I quote, speaking on ABC TV, "I personally don't think it does enough to get inflation down, and that's one of the pressing problems facing this country." Simon has taken a direct shot at Paul Keating and Bob Hawke, and why wouldn't he? Because he was duped. He did a deal on behalf of the rank and file in this country based on an earnings projection of 6.5%. And he's going to have a lot of trouble holding that deal together when, earnings rates, when, when, when prices are now running uh, at 7.5%. Uh, because when he agreed to the 6.5%, this guy was telling him inflation would be 4.5% in the year to June of this year and 3 to 4% in the year to June of next year. He was totally duped. He agreed to 6.5%. The pressure's on and he knows he can't deliver. And he's already had to back off once in the course of the last uh, 12 months. You remember your concept of a wage tax trade-off? He couldn't deliver on that, could he? Because we ended up getting a wage increase across the board on top of the tax, uh, tax cuts from July 1. You gave ground to, the, to your mate, your special relationship with the union movement, and uh, <coughs> You're about to do it again. These earnings forecasts are going to, uh, earnings numbers are going to come in well above forecast. The final area, though, and the most disturbing thing uh, to me, is the failure of, of, uh, of this budget to address what is our fundamental economic problem, and that's the lack of production and the lack of exports in this country. And all we get, all we get in the so-called micro-reform agenda, is a new IAC. And if you look at it, it's basically a new name and a couple of years of studies, and on the list of studies you wouldn't think they were the most important studies to be getting underway if you were serious about micro-reform. If in doubt, send it to a committee and hope the thing goes away. No micro-reform strategy, and we know why, he got rolled. Right? They got into Cabinet, they had the discussion and he got rolled. But there are some fundamental impediments to production in this country, and until you develop policies that will uh, bring down those impediments, reduce them or eliminate them, we are never going to be able to trade out our way out of these difficulties. There are six main sets of impediments that I think you should uh, be directing your attention to at the present time. First, the tax system, where burden of tax is too high and it saps incentive. It discourages savings investment and it encourages consumption and debt. And you don't understand it. You think you've got a national savings policy and all you're doing is taxing the life out of superannuation. The benefits that we're supposed to get out of this superannuation scheme don't come to the early to, to middle 1990s and all that time you're collecting nearly a billion dollars a year tax out of superannuation. You don't even understand the issue of superannuation. The second area that needs attention is the role of government. Government spends too much, it regulates too much and it spends too much of its time trying to run businesses it shouldn't be running. Australian Airlines, Qantas, Commonwealth Bank and so on. You need policies that bring about substantial cuts in expenditure, that reduce regulation, that, uh, that privatise these, uh, these government businesses. Thirdly, there's labour market reform, the need to tie wages to productivity, to decentralise the process, to restore some incentive. Uh, at the workplace level in terms of wage negotiation. Until you do that, you are going to persist with a floor of 6 to 7 per cent under our inflation rate. In your own budget, you say that inflation this year is going to be 7.5 per cent here and 4 and 3 quarter per cent in the rest of the world. And you're quite happy to go on year after year with our inflation rate near double that of our trading partners and wage increases near double that of our trading partners when you look at the, those relative to productivity. Fourthly, there's a desperate need to get interest rates down and to stabilise the currency. You've had an ex a currency that's been going up and down like a yo-yo in recent years. Why would Senator Button's uh, uh, investment take place in the manufacturing sector when the dollar goes down 40 and comes back 26 per cent in the space of a few years? Fifthly, there's a lot of infrastructure inefficiencies. Too much competition or too much regulation or work and management practices in things like coastal shipping, waterfront, road rail and air transport, communications, a lack of airport facilities and runways, and so I can go on. No answers in any of those areas. And finally, of course, there's a need for a revamped education and skill system. Our skills are in short supply. We have a rigid wages system that erodes incentive, and we have uh, an education system that doesn't have too much to do with excellence anymore. The, the fundamental problem in this country, as I said, is the, is the uh, 
the deficiency of production and the deficiency of exports. And this budget does nothing about those indeed to the extent that it does anything in relation to the corporate sector, the vehicle for change in that regard, it rapes them. Order. The honourable member's yeah. time has expired. Yeah.